I'm also, I'm going to continue from where I stopped. The previous video, I discussed about the inspection of the chest. If you can remember, I said clearly that if you want to examine a chest, there are four different ways that you can, or four different methods of examining the chest. Inspection, percussion, palpation, and auscultation. So last video or last lecture, I stopped at physical inspection of the chest, whereby I discuss different conditions that you can inspect with your naked eyes, either congenital conditions or acquired conditions. So now I'm also going to discuss about how you are going to inspect the chest, but through investigations. By the time you do an x-ray of the chest, you tell your patient, because there are other conditions that you can notice you with your naked eyes when you examine the chest of the person. You have to ask that person to go and do chest x-ray. The chest x-ray is going to reveal what is inside the chest. So it is going to reveal the conditions that are not you know, visible with, by, by American with your naked eyes on the chest. <clears throat> if you remember, remember I told you that <coughs> one can palpate the cervical rib on the chest, but you can also palpate the lumbar rib at the back if you ask the person to turn back, and then you palpate the lower, you know, lo uh, lower part of the chest, uh, chest, to it, chest uh, cavity, and then from there you can also palpate the lumbar rib. But through X-ray, you can also inspect you know the x-ray and then you can see an extra rib either cervical rib or lumbar rib so x-ray can also clearly show you cervical rib or lumbar rib or combination of all similarly if there are fractures along the ribs or their corresponding cartilages x-ray still can show you because during accidents especially during dashboard injuries, the steering can break some of the ribs, especially if somebody is driving in a high speed and then you suddenly match break. So you can easily bend forward and then the steering, you know, the dashboard can push, you know, the steering so that you can have collision with the steering over the chest. And so that can fracture multiple ribs, including the sternum. So one can also see fractures of the ribs and also fractures of the sternum, which mostly is commuted type of fracture that one can see on the sternum. So when somebody has fractures of the ribs, you know, actually uh, it may be on one side or maybe on either uh, or, 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 or on both sides. So it can be on the right or on the left or on both sides. There may also be associated sternal fracture. One major problem with these fractures of the rib is that the feces of the fractured ribs can go and break or injure the lung tissue. And you all know what is contained in the lungs. is what? Air. So it is air that is inside the lung. Once the fractured end of the ribs pricks any part of the lung, the air will just come out. So the lungs are going to be deflated. And so the air will now come into the pleural cavity. By so doing, you have air in the pleural cavity. And that is what we call pneumothorax, which I will discuss later on. So again, the fractured ribs can also injure certain important vessels. For example, if it is the second or the first rib, you know that the first rib is very close to the great vessels, subclavian artery and subclavian vein are very big vessels. So once this rib is fractured, these great vessels can also be fractured. Are you clear? Or the clavicle along the line, since it's associated, associated with the root of the neck, can also get fractured when there is a fracture of the ribs. So, and so these fractures can have effect on the vessels. So once a great vessel has been endured by any of these fractured bones, bleeding may 
continue profusely. You get, it? you get it? And so if the bleeding is not arrested because there are big vessels, somebody may bleed to death. You get my point? And so that is why fractured or fractures of the ribs, especially the first three, or the clavicle, is very, very dangerous because of the important great vessels that are close to this, you know, bones. Similarly, the sternum, you know, it has a relationship with the heart. So once this fractured, uh, this sternum, the, especially the lower end, lower part of the body of the sternum fractured, it is going to also affect or injure the heart. And you, you, you know that once the heart is just being, you know, ruptured by this fractured ends of the sternum, what will happen? Because the heart is the one that is pumping the blood. So by so doing now, if the pieces of the broken sternum go into the heart, to the extent that it ruptured, it ruptured the pericardium and then goes into the heart, that would definitely be a great problem. You get my point? By so doing, one may have, if one is lucky, that the substance of the heart is not been ruptured, but the vessels around the heart, the coronary arterial branches supplying the heart, if they are affected, one may have bleeding into the pericardial cavity. Are you clear? In that case, we have what we call hemopericardium. Are you clear? So we may have what we call hemopericardium because the sternum, the fractured ends, enjoy the uh, vessels, you know, around the heart. So the X-ray can show you the fractures along the body of the sternum. You can also see calcification of the cartilages. You all know that the ribs are all connected to the body of the sternum by their own corresponding cartilages. Are you clear? So each of these bones, except the first bone, that the first rib, is the one that is deficient of the costal cartilage. So the first rib is completely bony, doesn't have costal cartilage. But the remaining ones, they all have costal cartilages. Similarly, the 11th and the 12th ribs, they also don't have costal cartilage because they are the floating ribs and so they're not even connected to the body of the sternum. So now the costal cartilages, if you look at them on the x-ray of normal person, you will see that they are translucent. Unlike the bones, they are radio opaque. So the cartilages they are radiolucent. The bones, the ribs they are radio opaque. So in old people Somebody who is greater than 65, 70, 80, you will see that all these costal cartilages are ossified. They are calcified because there are deposits of calcium in there because of old age. So the bones, the costal cartilages, they become calcified. And that is what we call a calcification of the costal cartilages in old age. And so you are going to see that the ends of these ribs, the union of these ribs with the body of the sternum, is going to be radio opaque in old age. So once you see this classification, you know that that X-ray belongs to an old person. But if it is radiolucent, you know that it is a person that is not yet old enough to see this classification. You know, the functions of these cartilages along these ends of these ribs is to allow the chest to expand during inspiration when we are taking in oxygen and when we are bringing out carbon dioxide, the lungs will deflate so that the lungs will expand during inspiration and deflate during expiration. That is, the, these are the functions, this is the function of the costal cartilages. So somebody who has this calcified cartilages, what will happen? The chest expansion is going to be affected because the lungs, you know, they may not, they, they may not have enough room to expand because of this calcification of the costal cartilages. So it is going to reduce the chest expansion. So as I was telling you before, once there is a trauma that is going to, you know, rupture the blood vessels to the extent that the blood will not accumulate into the pleural cavity. So once you have air accumulating in the pleural cavity, as I told you before, that is what we call pneumothorax. If the fractured ribs are able to rupture some of the blood vessels, 
the blood vessels may bleed into the pleural cavity, and then they cause what you call hemothorax. That means bleeding or blood in the pleural cavity. That is what you call hemothorax. At times, the lungs, as a result of inflammatory processes, for example, pneumonia. I'm sure you know what is pneumonia. Inflammation of the respiratory tract, whether from the trachea or the bronchi or from the lungs, this can cause pneumonia from what we inhale from the air and what have you. And so the pneumonia can now cause, you know, at times accumulation or inflammation of the pleural cavity, thereby fluid, serous fluid is going to accumulate into the pleural cavity. And that is what we call hydrothorax, that means accumulation of serous fluid into the pleural cavity, and that is what we call hydrothorax. Similarly, at times, the pleural cavity may get inflamed as a result of the pneumonia inflammation of the lungs. And so if this pleural cavity is inflamed, the fluid inside it, the pleural fluid, may also get inflamed so that the bacteria can now grow excessively into the pleural fluid. And so it causes the formation of pus, the PUS, the pus. So once pus accumulates into the pleural cavity, that is what we call pyothorax. So you have pyothorax, you have hemothorax, blood accumulation, you have pneumothorax, accumulation of air into the, into the pleural cavity, and then you may also have hydrothorax, accumulation of serous fluid inside the pleural cavity. You may also have a combination of the two together. That means you may have air, you may also have blood in the pleural cavity as a result of the accident. So the fractured end of the ribs may break the lungs so that the lungs will now release air and also may rupture the blood vessels so that the blood vessels may now release blood into the pleural cavity. So you have air and blood, I mean air and blood inside the pleural cavity. In that case, that is what you call hemonymothorax. We call it what? Hemonymothorax. So you have hemo pneumo thorax that means blood and air together inside the pleural cavity as a result of accident air comes out of the lungs as a result of the fractured end of the rib impinging on it and then the fractured end of the ribs also rupturing the blood vessels so the blood oozes into the pleural cavity so we have a combination of blood and air into the pleural cavity and so that is what we call a hemonymothorax. All this can be seen in the X-ray. The X-ray can show you accumulation. In normal X-ray, you will find out that the pleural cavity is just a slit-like cavity. Once there is air accumulation in there, you are going to see that the lung tissue is going to be deflated or shift towards the opposite side so that the mediastinum, the middle line structures, that means the heart and the great vessels, are going to be shifted to the opposite side. And so you will see a very wide cavity here, which is radiolucent, because it is air that is inside there. That is what we call the pneumothorax there. So you are going to see deviation of the mediastinum to the opposite side. If it is fluid that is accumulated in there, whether blood or serous fluid or pus, that means the pleural cavity you are going to see it radio opaque because it doesn't allow air to pass through. So accumulation of blood or fluid in there, you know, <coughs> or pass is going to show radio opacity in the area of accumulation of that. And even with that, because of that accumulation of that substance, it is also going to shift, you know, the lungs and the mediastinum towards the opposite side. So you are going to see that through the X-ray. Similarly, in the X-ray, you can also inspect the substance of the heart. The heart can also be seen as a radio-opaque central structure in the chest. And so you are also going to see some part of the arch of the iota there. Folded is going to be act like that, you know? You know, so now you are the, in the X-ray, you are going to see the heart, and then you are going to see the arc, the folded arc of the iota there. And so you can also measure the dimension of the heart. You can also measure the dimension of the width of the chest. 
That is what we call cardiothoracic ratio. You get it? So this cardiothoracic ratio is just the ratio of the width of the heart over the ratio over the length of the chest. So you can measure the widest diameter of the heart, which is this one. You also measure the widest diameter of the chest, like this. And then whatever you get here, you do this over this. What you all get is what you call cardiothoracic ratio. And that one is very important in that one can delineate whether there is what you call cardiomegaly or not. Cardiomegaly, you are referring to heart enlargement, especially in people with heart diseases, either congenital or acquired heart diseases. In normal individual, this percentage is less than 50%. In normal individuals. So if that is cardiomegaly, it's going to be greater than 50%. So when you find out that the cardiothoracic ratio is greater than 50%, that means that is cardiomegaly, the heart is enlarged. But there are certain x-rays, whether you measure the cardiothoracic ratio or you don't measure, it is going to show you clearly that this heart is completely enlarged. And even the arch of the iota is going to be unfolded. So this arch you are seeing is going to be a little bit vertical like that. It's going to be folded. It's going to be unfolded instead of folded like that. So it's going to be unfolded. So all this can be seen in the X-ray. Are you clear? Similarly, apart from measuring this cardiothoracic ratio, you can also see, you know, the X-ray may show you, you know, if there are problems with the diaphragm. You all know that diaphragm is a muscular tendinous organ that partitioned the thorax of the abdomen. Are you clear? So it's a partition just like a decking in a story building. So it's like it is separating the thorax of the abdomen. Are you clear? So this diaphragm, you know, you can also see it dome shaped structure, you know, on either side, you know, so that it separates the, you know, chest of the abdomen. So now, when there is paralysis of the diaphragm, you can also see that from the x-ray. How are you going to see that? You know that if you take in oxygen, normally you know that the diaphragm is being supplied by which nerves? Intercostal nerves. So this and together with the phrenic nerve, you get it? So the phrenic nerve and the intercostal nerves as they supply the diaphragm, when you breathe in oxygen like this, the diaphragm now goes down. Are you clear? Because the lungs expand, the two lungs they expand so that they depress the domes of the diaphragm down. Uh, but when you release in ox uh, carbon dioxide like this, you take in oxygen, then you release. So the dome gets up because you are expelling the oxygen. The lungs are deflating. So the diaphragm, the domes are going to be noticed going up like that. Because they are muscular, when you take the x-ray, you are going to see the domes of the diaphragm. Are you clear? So, but once you have paralysis of one side of the diaphragm, maybe it is this side, you are going to have the opposite movement, what you call a paradoxical movement of the diaphragm. Instead of the diaphragm, when you breathe in oxygen, all this, the dome here, sinks down. This one sinks down. But if this one is paralyzed, this one is intact. Instead of this one now to go down during inspiration, it goes up. That is what we call a reverse movement of the diaphragm, and that is what we call a paradoxical respiration, or paradoxical movement of the diaphragm as a result of the paralysis of the diaphragm. So you have opposite movement. So this is as a result of the paralysis of the uh, diaphragm. And apart from that, you know, if there are herniations in the diaphragm, you know, you may see some signs, you, you may see it in the x-ray, or maybe when you do ultrasound, you know, it may detect signs of obstruction. You know, if you can remember, diaphragm has three openings, what we call VOA. I'm sure you know this. Voice of America, right? Yes, you have inferior vena cava opening, you have esophageal opening, and then you have aortic opening. Are you clear? So this is Voice of America at 8 o'clock. That is inferior vena cava opening. 
is official opening Voice of America at 10 o'clock. And then you have a YouTube opening Voice of America at 12 o'clock. Are you clear? So you have 8, 10, and 12. Are you clear? These are the three greater openings along the lines of the diaphragm. So the inferior vena cava opening is within the tendon, right portion of the tendon of central tendon of the diaphragm. You also have the esophageal opening and the atrial opening that are related to the posterior aspect of the tendon, tendon of the diaphragm. So here, apart from these three major openings, this is the inferior vena cava opening here. Inferior vena cava. This is esophageal opening, and this is the aortic opening. There are also two smaller openings, one anteriorly and the other ones posteriorly. So this is just like you are viewing the diaphragm from below. When you now cut open the anterior abdominal wall and you remove the intestine and the liver, and then you look at it from below, this is the diagram you are going to see. Are you clear? So you know that the, 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 the diaphragm has several areas of origin. Apart from the sternal origin here, it has coastal origins and lumbar fascial origin and what have you. So between around the sternum, you know, and the coastal portions, there is a small triangle here, anteriorly, thereby forming a triangular opening. This opening is what we call foramen of Mogagini. We call it what? Foramen of Mogagini. There is another opening also posteriorly that is lying between the quadratus lumborum by the lateral side, so as major on the medial side. So you have another triangular opening there. This is what we call foramen of Bogdalek. Bogdalek. Bogdalek opening or foramen. Bogdalek. So foramen of Bogdalek is also a triangular opening that is lying on the upper part of the quadratus lumborum. You get it? It is lying just lateral to the psoas major above the quadratus lumborum posteriorly. While the foramen mogagini is lying anterior by the side of the lower end of the sternum, you know, by the side of the coastal portion of the uh, diaphragm. So this opening serves, they serve as areas through which hernia can take place. So you may have some of the intestinal organs going into these small, small openings. You may also have these intestinal organs passing like the esophagus, you know that, passes through the esophageal opening. So some portion of the esophagus, especially the abdominal or the thoracic esophagus, can slide into the abdomen, or part of the abdominal esophagus may herniate into the thorax through the esophageal opening. Similarly, through the inferior vena cava opening, you may also have certain structures, you know, herniating into it and what have you. So herniation of the either of these openings, either the greater openings, this VOA openings, or the two smaller openings, the Mugagini and the Bokdalek openings, you know, they may, you may see some, you know, uh, herniation going into them, you know. So you can see, you know, the signs of herniation through the X-ray or by doing the ultrasound. Ultrasound can tell you that, yes, this is the site, the site where the obstruction or herniation is, is taking place because the echo there may likely change when you do the ultrasound, you know, along that region. So let me just also have a break here before I now continue to the next part of the examination of the thorax, that is the percussion.